Welcome to part two of this RDWorks Learning Lab about producing the RUS spec machine. Now today we're going to build this one piece tube mount and mirror holder. It's very simple. What you can see here we've got a piece of laser cut and folded channel with four small pieces welded into it plus a small plate on the end here to hold the mirror on. So it's a very very simple construction. First things first, look we've got another one of these mirrors. Throw that bit away and here we've got a very nice L-shaped mirror holder that matches the one on mirror 2. Well here we are at the at the mirror mount end and you'll notice here I've got a couple of tabs again which I'm going to just bend up very slightly like that. Now I've bent these tabs up and that allows me to make the mirror adjustable like this but it's actually quite difficult to get to this screw once the whole mirror assembly is bolted down into the machine but to make life a little bit easier for ourselves we're going to be using a hexagon headed bolt on there so we've got a seven millimeter spanner here which allows us to adjust this we'll just slide that against the stop and we'll put that in roughly the mid position about there. We've got some M5 by 20 screws here. We've got these very simple arms. We're going to put a spacer, an 8mm spacer between the arms there and then we're going to drop that into there. Now just to make sure that everything stays nice and true we're going to put another spacer just here like that. Now we've got an M5 by 16 here which is all we need for this one. So we can just bend those out very slightly because it doesn't really matter if they're very slightly bent out. To hold our tube in what we've got here is some 8mm polyurethane tube. Now I'm going to cut a piece off about I don't know 20 millimeters long We'll just slip that in there. Three pieces of tube like that. And three more pieces of tube in that end. <clears throat> okay, now I'm going to cut two more pieces of this tube off. And they can actually be longer if you want. So that you can get hold of them easily. So cut them off about an inch and a half, two inches long. And I've got myself a spare tube here. Well, I say a spare tube. This is an old tube that I've got. Um, and it's the same size as the one that we're going to work with in the machine. But here is the way in which it works. Look, we close that down onto there. And with a bit of luck, with a small amount of pressure, we should be able to put that one in there. And similarly at this end, if we just squash it just a little bit on the top there, we should be able to just pop that in there. So there is, it's a solid mount for the tube and you can, if necessary, rotate it. But it's basically secure. Now, I've purposely designed the clamp system like this because I've had to mess around with several other people's tubes at various stages helping them set these up and these great big lumps of foam that you get around the tube it's not a very good mounting arrangement and you don't need a very complex adjustable tube mount once you've got your tube mounted and set up against mirror one that's it you don't need to adjust the tube anymore so you need to keep this mechanism as simple as possible now not only have I kept it simple I've also referenced it I've purposely made it flat across, across the back here because we're going to reference it to the back of the machine so that we can use the back of the machine if we need to move it it'll always move in one direction one plane so we don't need to jiggle it around when we get it in the machine now in the past when I've had to fight with clamps and move them around on the base plate it's, it's been a real pain because I've had to get underneath and on top with spanners and screwdrivers or with keys 
as you'll see when we come to fix it on I've got a fixing slot in here and I've got these nuts on a plate so the nuts fix through there which means we only need a key underneath here and we don't have to worry about what's happening on the top here because the nut is not going to twist it's going to be locked in there now I'm pretty confident I won't need to take my existing tube out I should be able to undo my existing acrylic system slide it out and leave the tube in place so here's my existing tube with the uh, same clamping arrangement look we just pull these pieces of tube out and lift these up but unfortunately we cannot open up the clamps at the moment because look they're hitting the back plate and that's the problem we don't want to encounter with the new version we might need to disconnect the tube just here okay so I'm pulling this forward now The thing that's stopping it, I think, is that water pipe. So we'll just pull that water pipe up, and that will allow me to twist these back enough, like this, to get my tube up. bit of luck should be able to twist this around the tube and get it out so there was my red dot my built-in red dot pointer which as you see despite my best efforts didn't work let's just have a little bit of a spring clean in there shall we we'll take this opportunity while it's nice and free to give the tube a bit of a wipe down, give it a spring clean. I've got to disconnect this tube here because I'm going to make a slot in here for this tube to come through because it won't go over the edge of my channel. Now this is where I wish I'd probably been born an octopus. Everything fits in nicely so far. The centre of that front mirror relative to the edge of the machine is about 70 millimetres. So I need to set this to about 70 millimeters to the center of the mirror. I can mark where my fixing slot is going to be, which is just here. We'll just mark the end there as well, so that I know roughly where I've got that set. So we just go to work with our drill. Just make sure there's no, no there's nothing underneath there. These are the most useless drills ever, these chucks. Let's get a proper drill out, shall we? Well, it's not the prettiest hole in the world, but hey, it's a slot. Now, can I trust this thing to drill two five millimeter holes? And then we should be able to just roll this back into yeah, like that. Make sure that tube is out of the way and it sits in there neatly. What it's got to do, it's got to sit up against the back panel because this adopts a totally different approach to setting the beam as opposed to having fully adjustable tube clamps. Now we'll just find the fixing plate there, yeah. put that through the slot to stop it rotating. We'll just put the fixing clamp screw in leave it loose because we want to physically move this whole thing backwards and forwards if we need to. So that's the tube bank basically in but not positioned. So we're roughly positioned at this end to align with the mark that we put on there 70 mil center for the mirror. The principle of this system is significantly different than the normal beam alignment system. We've referenced the beam up against the back face of here. It doesn't matter where it is provided it remains the same. So if my beam does not hit mirror 2 in the correct center point 
all I've got to do is adjust this backwards and forwards and I can make my beam hit the center of mirror two. But before I do that, I've got to make this hit the center of mirror one, which is easy to do because I've got this mirror adjustable. That's our water connection made. We need to connect our earth. Now, what I need to do here is to make sure I leave myself enough room for my doohickey to go in. So normally I leave about a finger's width there like that. Now this has got to be at 12 o'clock because this is where the air is going to come out and go back down to the return line. So the only thing left to do now is to clamp the tube. These clamps more or less line up. So you can just put a small amount of pressure on there and clip. The whole thing goes in and now you've got a solid clamp. It's not solid at the moment because I haven't clamped the base down. This tube doesn't get hot. It gets warm, but it doesn't get hot. So these, these pieces of plastic here are nowhere near, anywhere near melting. So we've got everything back together and we should start to get some water through. Now this is the thing, if you want to get rid of bubbles in the tube, here's a nice neat trick for you. If you squeeze this tube sharply like that, there's plenty of flow through there. It's just that the, the bubbles are hanging around the top of the tube. You watch, when it goes there, they go zipping through there, so we've got plenty of flow. But there are these little places in the tube where we've got restrictions. They're little support pips that can catch the bubbles sometimes. Now that we've got everything set up, um, the first thing we're going to have to do is make sure that we've got the mirror set so that the beam hits the centre of the target. I've made this mirror so that it slides backwards and forwards so we can achieve that. And to do that I'm going to take one of my take one of my targets here which I've produced and just stick a little teeny weeny piece of tape across the top just to hold it in place in the mirror itself. Now I'll show you what I'm doing from the front of the machine. Now at the moment there's not a lot of light behind there and in fact what you're seeing in there is the window on the laser tube. Okay so now that we've got a white target on there we should be able to see that. I set my power to about 15% now I'm going to go down to about 12% and we'll put a pulse on there and see how things are lined up. Well they're a little low which I can't do anything about because I've already set the mirror height but that's not going to be a problem because it's only about two millimetres low and plus or minus three millimetres is not going to be a problem at all because although you might see that target as a round target about 23 or 24 millimetres diameter the laser beam doesn't see that the laser beam sees that it sees an oval target because the target is at 45 degrees so it's important that we get it correct left to right, but we've got a lot of scope up and down, as you can see. So it's not a worry that we're a couple of millimetres down on centre. But I need to get my little spanner out. And we've got to move the mirror forward by that much, let's just see. That looks pretty central. So that was dead simple to get the beam right in the middle of the target. Now these card targets, when we take them off, we need to just check behind the target because sometimes there's a little bit of condensation that forms behind the target and you might have to clean the mirror. So you must be careful about that. OK, well now we'll move on to mirror number two. We'll just make sure it's sitting in the mirror holder nice and smooth. Now, before we go diving into firing the laser beam at this mirror, we ought to be a little bit cautious. We'll just take a piece of card and we'll pop it in front of the mirror there. Because we've got no idea what height the beam is. We've got no idea where it is in general. So we'll blanket that area and we'll do a pulse. 
that's where it is and you can see where the target is so we're we're well off so let's gradually bring it back quite a long way quite a long way let's see how far that is off that's just about on the edge of the target so we'll bring it back a little bit more Well, that's on the target now, somewhere. Not correct, but it's about on centre. We have no way of setting the height of this. The height has already been set by the position of the tube. I can't adjust this mirror, but again, it's not too much of a problem if it does finish up above or below centre. Because again, with this mirror, we've still got an oval. So we've got plenty of scope up and down but very little scope left and right and so that's the important bit now actually we're not far off of center so now we've got a beam approximately aligned to make sure it's going to hit the target as we get closer to the back the angle is going to narrow and it's definitely going to hit the target so we'll push this to the back and we'll produce what I call a target burn so this is the first stage of setting the beam now you can just about see what's happening there at the back position and we'll just do a pulse wow <laughs> as i said to you many times before i'm a lucky guy sometimes and i think i ought to rush off and do the lottery now <laughs> well here we are at the front let's see what our second burn is like Well, I'm even luckier. That's bad news, because you can't see me setting it. I'm not going to fiddle with that. The only thing I'm going to do, just because I can, and it's simple, is we're going to loosen the tube, and we're going to pull the beam just a fraction that way. So to make that adjustment, all I've had to do is loosen these two screws off, bear in mind this whole fixture is lined up against the back so it's going to be perfectly lined up and it's not going to change its position relative to that mirror because the mirror and the tube are fixed together so all I've got to do is to physically pull this back about 1 16th of an inch there we go I've done it I haven't tightened it up yet but we can go and check what the result is might have just pushed it a fraction too far don't worry about the height because the height will change when I clamp it back down again I think that's pretty good so just to check what we're doing we'll just put a brand new target on there and give it a pulse well don't think we're going to complain about that now I'm going to check why because I've already set Y, all I've done is moved it in that direction to centre it up on the mirror. You might say, look, you're using the same targets. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. All I need is a spot on there, two spots in the same place. Because I can move this head and this Y around to get it exactly where I want. Now, again, we've got the same problem. We don't know where mirror two is set. So what we're going to have to do to put something in front of here to just find out where the beam is. Let's just sit that on there like that and give it a quick check. It's just there. That's pretty good. So I reckon that's going to work, but we'll just test it at this end and make sure that it hits the target. This is not beam setting, remember. This is just making sure that the beam is going to hit the target. Right. We've put a new target on there and we've moved this right close to mirror number two. And there's our mark. Now we'll move it away. And we are, doesn't really matter what the height or the position is. What we're trying to do is to copy that mark. I say it doesn't matter where that position is. For this 
type of head, which is adjustable in X and Y, it doesn't matter where the mark is. If you haven't got an adjustable head, you're screwed. <laughs> you can't adopt this very simple method. So let's try again. Wow, so that's pretty good. So we're just a little bit high. This is my lucky day. I definitely ought to go and do the lottery. Push it down just a shade. And I would say that that's pretty close. So we'll do the same thing again. We can use the back of the target because we're not interested in the, the actual target marks themselves. So here we are close to mirror two. Well, what can I say? The more you do it, the more confident you become. Sometimes you become overconfident, but hey, I'm lucky this time on camera. We've now got to check that the beam is vertical. Regardless of where it is on the mirror, provided it's on the mirror enough. Okay, so we've wound the table right up to the top of its stroke. We're now going to do a pulse onto that piece of card there. Right, now we're gonna drop the table down. Four, five, inches, something like that, 100, 120 mil. And we're setting the z-axis true to these lead screws. So there's our mark. Let's see how we got on. Not bad, very slightly towards the back. So I've got to push the beam forward. So here's my pivot point here, because it's not adjustable. So if I want to push the beam forward, I've got to move this adjuster at the back and push it down. And we'll make that move very, very slightly. Not a lot, just a hint. And what I'm trying to do is to make sure that I don't come off this mark at the front here. Got to go a little bit more. Just a fraction more. That looks pretty good. Okay, so now I really ought to just repeat the same thing again. This is tedious when you've got a very slow moving table. Here's our target mark. Now we drop the table down. Still just a smidge. There we go, spot on. So my, now, my beam is now absolutely perpendicular to the table. We've set Y, we've set X, and now we've set Z. And the final thing to do is to make sure that the beam is passing down the axis of this lens tube. And we do that by, we're mainly interested in it passing through the center of the lens. Now, if you look where the lens is, typically the lens is just about here. So we're not gonna be very far off if we drop this down. So if I hold that there and use the same target again. So we've rationalized the whole of this to just one target. And now what I'm trying to achieve as I've got to make sure that my burn is on that crosshair. So let's have a look, see what we've got. It's out of position in Y, and it's out of position in Z. So first of all, let's correct Y. Now, on this particular head, I have not got any Y adjustment, but we're gonna talk about that shortly. This is a very neat compact head, which I'm very happy with. But what I've done, I've separated my Y adjustment out now onto mirror two. So we've got to go to mirror two. Okay, so we've loosened the screws and now we've got to push it back very slightly like that. Now we can just check what we've done. No, we can go a little bit more. Just push it a little bit more. That looks pretty good. Let's just check it this way. Yep, that looks pretty central. So we need to lock that up because it changes the height. It changes the 
changes the position in Z because the mirror it will take up a very slightly different angle and the beam will reflect off the mirror at quite a large error. So, another target, easy come, easy go, they're cheap and plentiful as you can see. So we'll just pop that in there, we'll give it a tap check. So it's pretty good Y now. The only thing we've got to do is to correct it this way. Now at the moment the beam is towards the back which means that the beam must be hitting the mirror at the bottom and we want the beam to hit the mirror higher up. Now the beam is not going to change so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to drop the head to catch the beam. So I've loosened the screws off and we'll drop the beam, drop the head down a little bit and we'll see how that has affected the position of the beam. Not enough. A bit more. It's getting close. I think that's probably it. Damn the expense, let's have another target. Too far. So I've got to take it up a shade. Oops, it's far too much. What do you think, team? I think we live with that, don't you? So we'll just tighten the screws up and then we will check one more time. Right, happy? I'm sure we are. We might think we've got the machine set perfectly now. Mm, maybe not. We know that at this point here, furthest away from the tube, we've got a nice central burn. Now, we've set up in this corner and therefore we should have a nice central burn over here as well. Just make sure the target hasn't moved. And sure enough, spot on. Now we go to this back corner. And again, this is one of our setting points. So this must be spot on as well. And sure enough, it is. And here comes the problem. Eight out of ten of you guys will come to do this. And it won't coincide. Now, that's something that you call the fourth corner problem. We've talked about this before. It could be caused by many different things. The biggest thing is movement of mirror two. You get any movement on mirror two and it will change the position of the beam as it hits here and that will finish up changing the position of the beam here. It will no longer hit the sweet spot on that mirror. And it's all to do with something, and I cannot tell you what, something that is going to change the position of this beam bouncing off of here. The only thing that it can be is the angle of the mirror. And that's why I've gone over the top with my engineering on this bracket to make sure that I have total stability. Now there could be other things that are affecting it apart from that mirror bracket. It could be the alignment of your rails. There could be several other things that affect this, but that's the crucial test. Four burns in one spot and they all run down the central axis of the lens tube. Because we can't afford to have it right in three places and wrong in a fourth place, so either your focus will disappear over this corner or your accuracy will disappear. So the major change we've seen today is the tube and mirror one combined into one element. And how that allows us to have flexibility of adjusting the position of the beam 
onto mirror number two. So mirror number two has got its own nice stable Y adjustment on runners. We have no height control, that's all controlled by the position of the beam at the back there. And then finally we've got our Z control off of these screws on here. Now I have got an alternative head which I've been working on and I will explain that in another video. But it uses the 25mm mirror as standard and it builds the Y adjustment back into this head because at the moment this has only got Z adjustment and the Y adjustment is over here on, on mirror number two. So for those people that don't want to spend time making a new mirror number two and already have a bracket here, I've redesigned a head that will fit that combination. Okay, so here is something else that I've added to the machine, which you can already buy from Cloudray as the Ultimate Air Assist Kit. If you listen at the moment, there is no air assist pump on. If I turn it to manual, I've got full air assist coming out of here, which goes to the nozzle. And I don't have much choice on that, it's full air assist. But that's what I would probably want if I'm doing things manually. Okay, if I want to do a little bit of cutting manually, then I need my air assist. But what happens when I turn it to auto is it's waiting for the cycle to start. So whenever I run a program, the first thing that happens in the program is it will turn the pump on and it will then run the program and regardless of whether or not there is air assist required or not, if not, you will just get a small trickle of air through here which will protect the lens and if there is air assist required and you say yes, then you will get this. So there's a selection, a programmable selection to low air assist or full air assist and it also includes switching the pump on and off at the end of the cycle, at the end of your program. So you won't thrash your pump to death over its lifetime. It will only run as long as your program is running. So that kit with all the circuit diagrams etc are available through Cloudray. Now to make life easier for myself I've also added a couple of buttons on the front here. Now some people already have these buttons. Mine was a switch on the side here which is much more difficult to work. So I've got this but even this even though it is actually quite slow it's got quite a lot of if you look it's got quite a lot of overrun when I let my finger off the button. I can't get very precise positional control if I want to use this for setting Z. And when I come to do um, photo engraving I need very accurate control of Z. So I've also added a thumb wheel which allows me to wind the table up and down manually in very small increments. Now some of you guys will already have a big knob on the top here which makes which allows you to do it manually and you're probably very very annoyed about that because you haven't got a motorized table. Don't let that worry you too much because you can easily create your own motorized table very very cheaply. Take the knob off, drill and tap a hole in there something like M6. We can put an M6 cap screw in the top there. You wind your cap screw in until the nut touches and then with a spanner you tighten up the lock nut. And now you've created yourself a hexagon drive in the top there. And what does that do for you? Well most people have got one of these. If you can find the appropriate hexagon drive you have the opportunity of quickly winding your table up and down without spending any money on an extra motor. So without adding a motor the guys that make these machines have only got to put a hexagon drive hole in there and hey your problem is solved. It costs them nothing and it costs you nothing and you've got a motorized table. Well there are several interesting things that we could have a quick look at in this control panel. 
First of all, this is the relay for the air assist. Yeah, there's a connection on here called wind, which is how this is all connected in. And there are diagrams from that on the CloudRay website when you look up ultimate air assist. Now I'm using that same control signal that comes out of there to initiate this timer relay. Now this is quite an expensive timer relay which I happen to be using and I have in my inventory anyway. Um, I think it's about 50 or 60 quid. It's quite an expensive timer but it's a I mean most delay off timers are quite expensive and that's what this is. It's a delay off timer which is connected into this socket here which goes to my extract fan. So when I run a program like this my air assist comes on because the pump starts at the beginning of the program the pump stops at the end of the program and the fan carries on X number of seconds beyond the end of the program. In this case I've got it set to something like about five or six seconds. Probably a little bit short and maybe that should be set to about ten seconds. But hey, this is quite an expensive way of doing it. Now I'm going to have a word with CloudRay because they have got contacts with Ruida. This CN1 set of terminals, one of the items on there is called status. And then we've got out one and out two. At the moment, those out one and out two are unspecified. And in fact, they are all operating the same and they are all basically status. But I'm using the status one to switch the pump on and off in conjunction with the beginning and end of the program, which is basically what that status means. Now, it's possible that you could use one of these other outlets as a delayed off status that would allow me to connect a cheap relay to control the fan off of here. Well, I was planning to finish the video at this point, but hey, I think it's probably my female genes taking over. Uh, no, not my empathy, uh, my indecision. The, um, I think I'm going to push on and show you the new Mark II head which may be of interest to several people because that's the head that I think I should fit to this machine for CloudRay. I've been extremely happy with this head. It does a superb job and I think it's because it is mounted absolutely rigidly to this bracket just here. Now, the alternative that we used to have on here was this bracket assembly here and we had the head fixed out on this part here. Now despite being a very stiff and actually quite a heavy bracket there's still the possibility of the head twisting this way when it moves backwards and forwards very very rapidly because there is a cantilever between here and the mass of the head. And you also have a slight cantilever off of here which is bending it this way as well. Although, to be honest, I've not experienced any problem with why. There's been no wobble. I've been purposely checking for that. But on my other machine, where I have this, basically the same bracket, I have noticed, if I look at the edges here, you'll see that there is a sort of a, a bit of a, a curtains pattern just here, where the head is accelerating and going very slightly wobbly and that's happening at both ends of the picture. But I'm getting perfect results off this mechanism here. And I think the other machine would work perfectly okay if I slowed it down a little bit, just to de decrease the accelerations to stop the ringing. But that's not the idea of the exercise. The idea is to try and find out how fast I can run these machines. And this mechanism here seems to be the best mechanism. I have designed a Mark II version of this exact same mechanism this time, instead of using a 20 millimeter mirror, I've gone back to using a 25 millimeter mirror, which is much more standard. Now, it doesn't add a great deal more weight 
to the mechanism, I'm able to stiffen it up quite a lot with a Mark II design. Basically what I've done, I've added another angle piece inside here, another two millimetres inside, to throw the tube a little bit further away from these walls. And that has given me the opportunity to put a 25 millimetre mirror inside there. But at the same time, I've also added just a little bit more weight by putting a third or a fourth fixing point at the corner there so that I've really got a very nice stable fixing and there's no chance of this thing ever twisting or ringing. Now in addition to making it fit this machine like this I have also made another compromise to the design. No compromise, wrong word. Addition, improvement, enhancement. Let's just assemble this. So we shall remove that and this time this head not only fits this mechanism I've also added some lugs on the back here so that it will fit here as well so I can have my Y adjustment back onto the bracket but as I said, there is a small compromise that you have to allow for and the fact is that, you know, it is cantilevered off here and there is a risk that this head, if you drive it too hard, may have a slight ring on it. Now, there is sufficient thickness on here. It's four millimetres thick. If you, would, if you want to tap an M4 or an M3 hole through here and if you really do desperately need your little red dot pointer, as I said, I wouldn't advise it because you're adding mass to this head. But if you're not worried about ultimate speed then by all means you could drill and tap this and fix your red dot pointer because there's sufficient bulk here now. So we've bent this in the vise until it's 45 degrees. In other words I've lined that up with the bench. It's crude but it's adequate. But now there's another little thing that we have to do on this one before we send it across to the fly press and that's this little tab here we have to bend that the opposite way to this and we can't really do that in the fly press so we've got to do that in the vise set it up nice and square and then just turn it over 90 degrees like that now this next operation we have to have the male and the female tools set up so that they're flush with each other at the end because what we've got to do we've got to bend along this line and not that tab and you'll see what I mean and I can come up as far as that line there if I bend it very gently and just tease it like that what will happen is even though I may well have the line very slightly off to the center line of the tool it will naturally pull itself in as it starts to bend now as you can see here as I bend it I've got to make sure that I just tease this into the slot just there like that okay and that just literally pops in and, and rather than weld this what I've done I've left a roughly half a millimeter sticking out on that tab so that I can again just very gently rivet it and there we go, that's as strong as any weld. This other piece is made from two millimetres material as well, the, the mirror hold, the two pieces of two millimetre, but that could equally well be CNC machined. It may be easier, I don't know. So we just set that gap there roughly parallel, and we set this gap here roughly parallel. We won't worry about putting the mirror in just yet, because we can do that when it's fitted up there. It's easy enough to do. All we've got to do is undo those two screws just a little bit and the mirror should slide in from this side here. So let's take this one off for the moment. So in this case I've got a 15 millimeter bracket and I've got M4 by I think they're 10 millimeter long screws. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to try and choose the, uh, the, the furthest back position because that gives me the stiffest connection to the head and I can't remember which ones I use 
I could raise the head up by another about four or five millimetres. So we've got all sorts of combinations allowed for on this head because it turns out that not all machines are the same. That's why I've had to produce this piece of cheese. So there we are, it's as simple as that to fix the bracket on. With the hexagon head bolts, they just drop into these hexagon holes here to stop them rotating. It keeps them clear of the, uh, the lens tube. And now you see the reason for that tab there. It's a location tab on the top of the bracket and it allows me to adjust this in and out parallel. As well as holes in here to choose whether I'm up or down and at the moment I've got them in the correct holes because my beam appears to be somewhere across the bottom here. I've also got two sets of holes that I can use behind here. So we'll choose the lower set of holes at the moment because that's what I think we want to do. We want to lower the head. So we've got a lot more adjustment on this head than we had on the previous design. Let's see where the pulse is. There it is. So we've got to go in further. Now the further we can get this head in, the better in some ways. That's pretty central. Okay, now the great thing about it now is I'm really up quite tight against this bracket. So it's nice and stiff, relatively speaking. I haven't got much cantilever on it. Now it's not the right height, so let's just change the height a little bit. A little bit more. We've got it roughly in the right place now, but the most important setting is the one that we're shortly about to do. Bring the table up to the top and make a pulse. Take it down, and make a pulse. Well, that's not bad considering that's absolutely from nothing. So it means we've got to twist the mirror slightly just that way. Come back just a hint. Okay so now we've set Z true to the lead screws. Now we've got our Z axis true. We should be able to use one of these targets. Just drop it in there and we'll see where we are. A long way out. That means the beam is hitting high up on the mirror. So it just shows you how relatively unimportant this position here is. It's only a guide. You know, we've got to set this much more accurately and we can do that by loosening off these two screws here. And the beam remains the same but we want it to go down on the mirror so we've got to raise the head up. Oh, that's pretty good, isn't it? We can go just a fraction more. And there we go. So now we know we've got the beam on the sweet spot of the mirror so that it's passing vertically right down through the centre of the lens. I don't know, that's not bad, is it? Look, that looks reasonably central, which is what it should be. So that's this style of head fitted to the machine and you saw how relatively easy it was to get this set up. I haven't touched any of the other axes because we've not played with them. The only thing we've messed around with is the Z axis and the head. Now I will point out to you still that this, if I push it really hard, that I can actually move it. But it's pretty stiff. And it's very unlikely to move much, if at all, during normal engraving. As it jumps down from one line to the other, it overshoots 
and then it comes back and it's settled down by the time it gets to about one millimeter in. There is a very, very small amount of this flexibility that is affecting the scan. So you could probably run photographs at 600 millimeters a second and certainly at 400 millimeters a second. So we'll just quickly rip all this off. So there's our little dot and we're spot on. So exactly the mirror has not changed from the previous setting. So that really means all we've got left to do is to just make sure that the beam is running down the central axis of the lens tube and it's not. So first of all we need to adjust Y. Well in this instance we've got to go to the mirror over there and adjust Y. So you're going to move the mirror slightly backwards. Pulse and like that. Now we tighten the mirror up. Okay so we're central this way and this indicates that we're actually too low on the mirror. I've got to drop the mirror down to get the beam higher on the mirror. There we go, spot on. A quick look at that. Absolute perfection. Let's push it up to 600. I'm happy with that. That will show. That won't show any problems at all when you're doing photo engraving at 600 millimeters a second. So that's the difference between this head and this mounting. The stiffness. That is the design I'm going to offer to Cloudray because that is the stiffest possible configuration of head that we can get and still have this wonderful C-series lens tube which gives us so many lens and nozzle options. See I've currently got the accelerations set to 30,000 and 600 millimeters a second and 30,000 seems to work and I'm not losing steps. We'll see what happens at 800 and if I lose steps you'll understand exactly what losing steps means. You don't need to actually test for it, you will see it and hear it. At 800 millimeters a second I will have to reduce the acceleration. I first of all have to reset the machine because I've lost zero. And while that's happening I'll change the acceleration down to 20,000. You see I've got more overrun now. 800 at 25,000. Let's try a thousand millimeters a second at 25,000 acceleration. We're probably going to push it over the edge again. So we've got to change the acceleration now. We'll put that back to 20,000 as opposed to 25,000. The question is, because there's so much overrun, the cycle time will be longer. It took 17 seconds to run that test. And I suspect I can probably run the same test faster at 630,000. Even though we're running slower, that only took 12 seconds. So that's five seconds less running slower because I get less over travel. What I really need to do now is write a list of all the key things that we need on this machine, like the lightweight head, the C-series lens tube, the flexible rack and pinion drive system, the nice stable Y mirror mounting system, an ammeter, a tube mount that integrates mirror one, an auto selecting air assist valve, the air assist pump switching on and off at the beginning and end of the cycle, the fan, the extract fan switching on and off at the end of the cycle, 
but with the end of the cycle, a 10 second delay. Is there anything else that you want? Yes, you want a good quality tube, a CR70, and a power supply, an 80 watt power supply. When you get a machine like this normally, it comes with a reject tube and probably a reject power supply that's a little bit slow response. I mean it's quite incredible that I can get 600 millimeters a second out of this power supply and it's actually responding and giving me single dots. The power supply is supposed to have a response time of less than one millisecond to give me 90% of the demand that I'm asking for. So basically it's a one millisecond response time. That's what they're promising from the power supply. What am I asking it to do? Well, first of all, we're doing 600 millimeters per second. One millimeter is going to take one second divided by 600. 0 0.001 is one millisecond. So we're talking about 1.7 milliseconds per millimeter. Running my test, which is 254 dpi, one dot equals 0.1 millimeters. Okay, now we know that one millimeter takes 1.7 milliseconds. So therefore one dot is a tenth of that, which is 0 0.17 milliseconds. So that's five times faster than the claimed specification of the power supply. So this power supply I've got in here, can I be crude and say it's bloody quick, and it's only a normal MYJG power supply. And that's the way that you can very quickly tell how good your power supply is. If you can produce single dots at that sort of speed, the power supply must be responding to give them to you. Well, on that very pleasing note, all I've got to do is write out a specification sheet, along with passing some of this kit to Cloudray so that they can fit it up to a machine like this. Anyway, thank you very much for your time and your patience and we're getting close to the end of this machine's evolution.